Good morning, one and all, and welcome to the Rangers Review Morning Briefing. It is Friday, the 11th of October, and uh, we're here to talk all things Rangers. I'm Derek Clark, and I'm joined this morning by Chris Jack. How's it going, Chris? Not too bad. We're slowly but surely working our way through this international break. Feels like there's been more international football than domestic football so far this season, um, and still another one of these, still another one of these breaks to come. Next month, I believe as well. So, uh, no, I'll be glad to glad to see the see the back of them and try and build up a bit of um, domestic and European momentum. Hopefully, yeah, I'm not a big fan of them as well. When we had one last month, didn't we? Just uh, yeah, like you, uh, we seem to be stopping just when we're gathering a bit of momentum. But uh, yeah, we're not over the hump of the this international break yet. I know there were some games played last night. England were a surprise defeat to Greece, but. Uh, yeah, when does Scotland play? They play is it tomorrow or I've got no idea. <laughs> I, I believe it's Saturday. Um, Saturday early on um, in Zagreb, I understand. But um, mm. I saw the also stories the last couple of days about that not being available on on TV, and you can only only watch on YouTube. As we know, all the best shows are available on YouTube. So um, <laughs> if, if you get bored of the Scotland game, you can come and watch some of the uh, Rangers Review content instead. Yeah, just pie the Scotland game off, folks, uh, and uh, yeah, you can watch uh, uh, get plenty of content on uh, the channel, that's for sure. Um, right, uh, we're going to invite a, a lot of questions as well, because not much happening. Uh, we'll discuss uh, your piece yesterday, Chris, just on uh, the CEO search, and uh, yeah, we'll invite questions. So if you want to get your points across, folks, then, then please do, uh, and uh, they'll be very much welcomed, and myself and Chris uh, can batter through as many as we possibly can. Um, well, before we do that, do you see, I've seen that the Northern Lights were uh, out last night. Did you see them from uh, uh, Casa del Jack last night, Chris? Yeah, I didn't actually. One of, uh, one of my mates texted me uh, about half past nine or so to say, did you did you see it? Um, and I, I was actually sitting in here in the office um, working on a big interview that we've got on the site uh, for next week last night. Um, and completely oblivious to the fact that it was was happening, so it wasn't out. Uh, I, I didn't see them out out the window. That's just behind the behind the laptop screen here. Um, and uh, I said completely, completely missed it once again. Uh, yeah, I was the same. I've seen people posting pictures uh, of them uh, down here in Warrington. I looked out the window, couldn't really see them, uh, and then went back to bed. So uh, yeah, there you go. But uh, <laughs> they were they were here. I'm sure was it last year around about the same time, or, or was it February time? I think they were. Uh, they made an appearance, so uh, yeah, quite something. So uh, if you if you've seen them last night, folks, then uh, yeah, well done. Uh, anyway, right, let's move on because uh, your piece uh, yesterday, Chris, on the CEO time scale um, is a brilliant piece. Go and check it out, folks. Uh, you look at the boardroom up here. Well, of course, news earlier on in the week that the head of football operations, uh, Craig Robertson, was departing from the club. Uh, what is the latest with regards to that? I mean, we discussed it pretty much in detail on Wednesday, I think it was. But um, where are we with regards to that? We know it's a, a priority, isn't it, getting that CEO in at this moment in time? I think the the, the search is still ongoing. Um, I think mm -hmm. you know, we see it on the on the site, we see it on on the shows, we see it on social media. There's this real um, wish from the fans for something to for something to happen. Um, Craig Robertson departing was not the thing that people were thinking was uh, going to happen. I think that's going to focus a bit, uh, minds almost a wee bit on the number of number of positions that Rangers are uh, that Rangers are looking at. Um, I think if you were to prioritise them, it would be chief exec, then chairman, then for me head of academy, and then director of football ops. Um, I think that, that that would be my, my preference in terms of how how those four uh, positions are filled. I think the, the chairman search and the CEO search can almost go on at almost the same time. Um, also, those two guys have to have, once they're in position, they have to have a good working relationship. There's no point in your chairman and your chief exec being at, at loggerheads with each other and not agreeing on how the business should be run, how things should operate in a football sense. So it's important that those two do operate um, hand, hand in hand. But I think the... the the chief exec will naturally have a, a say in who's going to be head of academy and certainly who's going to be um, the head of football ops um, heading in, into the into the second half of the season. So I think that's the that's the kind of priority list time scales as we discussed the other day. Um, as John Gilligan mentioned, his Sky interview he, he, after he held his first. 
first Pesach um, a few weeks ago. Um, that, that Christmas time scale, I know that can alert people because everybody thinks that Christmas is a, a long way away. Christmas is not as far away as um, as, as people think it is. Yes. It will take time for Rangers to actually get through this process. And I think if they've got, at least if they've got a name and they've got someone signed and sealed and ready to ready to come into the club by then, I think that's roughly the time scales that we're looking at. Um, again, as we touched on the other day, any candidate could possibly have a notice period to work through. It could be six weeks, it could be three months, it could be six months, and in worst case scenarios, you would be surprised if anyone was held to a notice period of that of that length. Um, or say James Bisgrove had, had his notice period at Rangers, a deal was done, he was able to move on and go and start his new job in Saudi. And I think Rangers would be confident that if they were to go to someone who is employed elsewhere, hopefully a, a notice period doesn't become too big an impediment. Because if it does, and you get to Christmas and you make an appointment, and you're then held to, worst case scenario, a six-month period, that's then nearly a year without Rangers having a having a chief exec, and that's not a situation the club uh, want to uh, want to find themselves in. That's that's not not good in a business sense. It's not good in a, in a sporting sense. So, yeah, I know there's this. Um, I said that there's this will, there is this this wish for for things to for things to happen. Yesterday, it's not going to happen as as quickly as that. But the search for for all these positions is is ongoing. But clearly, the the chief exec is the is the most important thing um, for Rangers to get that uh, to get that position and uh, get that appointment sorted. Yeah, lots of questions coming in off the back of that and uh, other points as well. Uh, my dad actually messaged in. He says, uh, Thea says, hi, my niece is uh, watching. So, uh, hi, Thea. Uh, hopefully, you're enjoying the show and uh, behaving up there. Um, so, uh, yeah, fantastic stuff. And uh, Scott B, uh, in fact, there was a point that came in from uh, Stuart. Uh, and many others with similar points uh, as well. It says, uh, going with the amount of executive staff we're losing, is it more a desirable option for investment with less executive staff in place? A clean slate, basically. Uh, we touched on this a little bit on Wednesday as well, Chris. Um, will we to people suggesting, will there be some sort of a takeover or a big investment? Um, not heard anything murmurings of that just now. I know John Gilligan did say uh, they were exploring investment opportunities. I think Dave King himself said that as well, didn't he? And the, the need for um, outside investment. But um, where are we with that? I don't, just to pick up on, on Stuart's point, we'll take that first. I don't think it's a case of clearing the decks, if you like, so it then becomes mm -hmm. easier for, for someone else to come in. Um, if you think of the the funds it would take to not just buy into Rangers, but control Rangers. So you've got two, two types of investors, basically. You've got guys who like the like the current investor core, like Sir John Bennett, like Sir Douglas Park previously, like Sir Dave King to a huge extent previously. Um, we're not interested in owning Rangers outright. No, they're putting their money in to help the club along this um, along this journey, along this rebuild. You've then had more recent investors like Sir Julian Voltart, obviously, and um, like Sir John Halstead, who clearly have a, a role to play at, at present. Stuart Gibson came on board a couple of seasons ago. Um, these guys, they were not taking just a million pounds worth of shares to then eventually one day launch a, launch a takeover, but that's not why they're, they're not there to own Rangers, they're there to help finance Rangers. If you're looking at um, like, a, like an actual takeover of the club, if you wanted a, a shareholding that would give you that sort of boardroom influence, you're going to have to tick off a number of those, those shareholders. You're going to need Douglas Park shares, you're going to need Dave King shares, you might need John Bennett shares. There's a lot of there's a lot of guys round about that that level of shareholding that you would have to you'd have to in effect buy off to give you that level of, of influence. You're not going to come in and say, Well, I've got a transfer kitty of a hundred million pounds, I'm happy for someone else to go and spend it. If you've got that money to put into the angels, you want to be the guy that decides how it's going to be how it's going to be spent. If you want to decide how it's going to be spent, you have to have that shareholding to give you that boardroom influence, either as chairman or to have a couple of directors on the on the PLC board. So there's two two types of investment that we can that we can look at. Heard nothing to suggest that Rangers are at the, the takeover stage, um, and yeah, you know, I think you're looking at the current the current core of guys that have put their money in. Is how how far do they do they want to go? 
are they already in deeper than they perhaps thought they would be? Are they willing to, to go again? Or are we at the stage of there's no more money coming in and Rangers just have to make do and try and operate the business a bit more um, sensibly, if you like, from a, a financial point of view? Something that John Bennett was a big uh, a big driver of over his tenure as chairman. He spoke a lot about bringing down that, that 10 million or so deficit every year. Rangers should be in a better financial footing for that work. But you then look at the gap on the pitch. It's going to clearly take yeah. either money from prize money, which is going, to, is going to be difficult to achieve. It's going to take European money, difficult to achieve. It's going to take transfer money, difficult to achieve because how many assets are in this are in this squad at present? For Rangers to really bridge that gap, it will require a level of external external finance. As you mentioned, that's something that Dave King spoke about when I spoke to him a couple of weeks ago. And it's where is that finance going to come from? Is it going to come from the guys that are there already? Or is it going to come from new people coming in? If it's going to come from new people coming in, I think it will be on the same sort of terms that we've seen previously, rather than somebody coming in and say, I want to buy and run Rangers. Because uh, the, the bill for that um, is certainly, uh, it's certainly more substantial than just someone that wants to come in and chip into a transfer kitty or chip into an infrastructure project plus then potentially get a seat on the board. Yeah, we need a freshness, an injection of freshness, new ideas, I think, and obviously that brings it with it, new investment as well. Where that comes from, I do not know, but uh, yeah, uh, there is concern, a lot of comments coming in, and as has been the case uh, with a number of positions still to be filled, a lot of fans uh, feeling a little bit apprehensive about the future. Uh, John Allen with the point says the whole thing is uh, very worrying. Uh, yeah, I can understand that. Um, Rangers need to get the foundations in place pronto. Uh, big shout out incidentally, I know we're, we're, la- we're back live on Instagram and uh, Cammy gets in touch and says, Derek, how's things mate? You recovered from Malmo. Good to meet you over there in uh, Malmo, Cammy. And uh, yes, I have recovered, but what a trip that was. Absolutely fantastic. Um, let's get to some of the points that are coming in. Uh, shout out here to JT, he says, Good morning, Derek, Chris, and fellow Rangers Review family. It's my 40th today. Now better to spend the morning on a coffee and a review. Happy birthday, JT. Uh, many happy returns, and hopefully you have a fantastic day. Uh, and staying on the topic of <laughs> birthday shout-outs, uh, CB55 says, Happy 17th to my boy, Caden. Uh, so happy birthday, Caden, as well. Uh, let's move on to on-field uh, questions, because there's quite a few that have uh, came in at this moment in time. Uh, but one slightly um, off-field, World's Greatest DJ says, Any update on the Conor Barron transfer fee tribunal? Um I think Aberdeen, were Rangers willing to pay, am I right in thinking it was about half a million pounds, Chris, and Aberdeen were looking for more. Um, do we have a date for that as yet? For the life of me, I can't think if there was a date scheduled for it. Hey, not that I'm aware of. Um, it, it was on my to-do list a few weeks ago, and as per usual with all matters, Rangers <laughs> and else then jump, jumped above it in, in terms of that to-do list. And it, was, it was shuttled back down again. Uh, I will try and ask the question and see how see how far away we are. Um, I know it is, I think the story was out a couple of weeks ago to say that it was going to go to that, uh, go to that tribunal. Um, if you're unsure how that process actually works, I had a piece on the site um, a couple of months ago kind of going through why or how we would get to uh, get to that stage. Um, slightly surprised Aberdeen haven't just um, accepted the offer that Rangers, that Rangers made, um, but it's also their, mm. their prerogative, they're quite entitled to go down Go down that tribunal route if um, if they believe that Baron should be um, worth more of a fee than uh, the Rangers were offering. Um, and ultimately, once once that um, as, as I explained in that in that piece, once that fee and that uh, deal structure has been set, that's it. No, whether you like it, whether you hate it, whether you love it, there's nothing you can do about it. That's the um, that's the final uh, final decision on it, and both clubs then just have to have to proceed after that. But uh, no, no, no date as uh, no date as such as uh, that I'm aware of as yet. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, but as soon as we'll find out, folks, uh, we'll, we'll let you know. Uh, Scott B with the point. We sort of touched on this. I think about yourself, Chris, and yesterday with uh, Joshua he says we need to sign a striker to replace Dessers ASAP. We need to sell him. Um, I wouldn't necessarily think Rangers need to sell him, but they do need help up there for him. I know Danilo's back training. Uh, jury's still out whether he will be the answer long term. Uh, but I would like to see Rangers boosting the firepower that they have in January. I think they have to, Chris. There's no two ways about it, really. 
I think the next couple of weeks could um, could see people really not jump on the bandwagon, but could see calls for more firepower um, during that January window. The next couple of weeks could really could see those calls ramped up, yeah. depending how how things go. Um, we mentioned that a couple of times that we don't think Rangers have enough have enough goals. We don't think they've got enough cutting edge in this in this side. You look at the makeup of that forward line. Dessa's clearly the, the first choice by quite some distance at present because there's doubts over the level that a man is at fitness wise and in terms of his, his overall game. Danilo obviously has his own issues to overcome. Apart from that, there's nobody else that you can rely on to go and play that uh, go and play that centre forward role. Um, mm. If you bring someone else in, where do they fit into that pecking order? Do they go straight in above? Sergio Dessers, if they do, fine. Dessers just has to take that on the chin and has to then take his chances and has to try and uh, work his way back into the side. What does that then mean for Danilo, a guy that you've got a lot of money tied up in in terms of wages and transfer fee? What does that do in terms of if a man, if he becomes, if you like, fourth choice in that in that regard, what does that then do? Where does he get his football to um, then try and progress and to try and come on to the type of level that the club need them to be at. So it's not as easy as just bring one in and you'll end up with four. It's a knock-on effect of what that does to the three that are there. But ultimately, I think we would all agree, Rangers need more goals in this in this side. Uh, I, I don't think they've got the, the level of um, the level of goal that they will require to go on and um, win the title at present. I think, as we mentioned the other day there, I would, wouldn't be surprised at all if Dessers surpasses his, his tally of of last season, you'd expect him to get get to that twenty mark, and he might end up one or two ahead of what he, he managed to get last season. Is that going to be enough for him personally? He can come the end of the season. He can say, "I've held up my end of the bargain. I've I've done my bit." It's what's what's behind that. It's where where else are the, are those goals coming from? Um, I say uh, Danilo has to has to work his way back into the back into the team first and foremost. I don't think you can expect too many from him. We don't know at all what you can expect from a mega man if they get twenty between them. Is that is that realistic? Is that over? Is that overstretching it? So I think depending how what position Rangers are in come come to start the transfer window, I know it's a big talking point. We discussed it. I felt like almost on a daily basis during the uh, during the summer. Where's the striker coming from? Or certain names um, are coming up more uh, regularly than uh, some other ones. Depending where Rangers are. I think we will see this this real call from the fans. It will be something that comes up on the on the show. People just looking for another another striker to come in. In that situation, yeah. I would be surprised if it's a big fee type striker. I think you'd be looking at another Fabio Silva, perhaps type type loan, someone yeah. of that uh, someone of that uh, profile to come in and just do a job in the second half of the season to try and get Rangers over over the line depending on, on what their aspirations are. I'd be surprised if they go and spend a big fee, having already put significant fees into Dessers and Danilo, I'd be surprised if they go and spend another big fee on another another number nine. Um, mm. Before that happens, you would have to assume that one of those two will, will have to move on. Interesting. Uh, just on Danilo, Charles says, has Danilo, Danilo ever played a full game for Rangers? He's played three full 90 minutes. He played against uh, Aris Limassol, the 1-1 one, one, draw last season in the Europa League and he also played 90 minutes against Livingston in the league and also against Aberdeen which was a 1-1 draw up at Todry. so uh, he's played three full matches um, so not enough uh, we all know why uh, his injury situation uh, whether he can steer clear now and really push on remains to be seen um, but Rangers do need him to come back and, and really start firing uh, I believe uh, John uh, with a point as well just on the striking situation Derek why not try to fit in young Lovelace now till January look good before his injury um, just not get a look in yet uh, I was surprised to see him actually warming up when I was in Malmo uh, and I was like no that's good um, obviously Eggerman didn't travel but Never got on. Uh, are we likely to see him, Chris? Do you think? Um, I think he probably falls into the same category as Bailey Rice in terms mm. of fans would like to see them get the chance, but when is that chance actually actually going to come? Um, we have a piece on the site actually on on Saturday morning, looking at the 
the academy system and looking at that that gap now that famous eighteen to twenty one um, gap of yeah. coming through a youth system getting so far and then being able to to make that to make that jump um, and I'll, I'll look a wee bit at how like of Leon King and Alec Lowry fared and look at the prospects of someone like Zach Lovelace or someone like Bailey Rice. Will they get their chance? Is Rangers is Rangers to, to boil it down? Is Rangers the right the right club for them? Um, saw a bit of discussion online yesterday actually about about the B team and the the lack of games that they're playing. Um, so again, yeah. the, that uh, that piece on on the site uh, goes into that. Uh, I won't give too much away. I'll urge everyone to go and read it tomorrow morning. Obviously, but mm-hmm. it looks at some of the things that Rangers Rangers tried. So they had. Their games program, they then moved into the low and league and felt it wasn't adequate enough. It wasn't giving them the, the outcomes that they required. So they then pulled out the low and league. They tried to have the conference league idea and have B teams um, included in the in the SPFL setup. They felt that was a better option. The manager actually spoke, I think it might even have been the first or second presser of the of the Premiership season. The manager spoke um quite passionately and quite extensively about youth development and B teams and why he felt that was the way forward. Rangers are big advocates of that system, but um, in typical Scottish football fashion, if it's good for Rangers or potentially good for Celtic, too many clubs then aren't interested and they don't want to don't want to go down that road. Um, there's a bit of detail on that in that in that piece uh, tomorrow morning as well. So it comes down to if you are Lovelace or you are Bailey Rice is Rangers actually now the right club for you? Will you get the opportunities in, in a B team to take your game to the required level so that when your chance does come at first team level, are you actually ready for it? Are you there because you've earned it and you're good enough? Or are you there because you perhaps fill a, a space in terms of a UEFA coefficient or you fill a space in terms of a jersey on the on the bench? And I think it's, it's now at crunch time for these guys. We've seen, like I said, Lowry and King, it's not worked out for them. They will have to move on. They are not going to be Rangers first team players. That that generation, um, you can also include like Adam Devine in that in that as well. That generation has almost been has almost been lost. Rangers are not going to get anything out of that generation. Can't afford the same thing to happen with the next ones. You think of say, Rice and Lovely, it's been the, the two probably more higher profile ones. There's other guys within other guys within the B team like Stevens, like Paul and Zio. Guys, there are they going to make that make that progress? Is the is the academy set up good enough to then produce first team players, or is it just not going to is it just not going to happen for these guys? So um, I said there's a, a lot to unpack from that from that piece that's on the site tomorrow. I think it will become a bit of a a bit of a talking point as this season goes on because I know it's been mentioned before. Why are certain members of Clermont's first team squad being given chances ahead of? players that I think the fans would like to see uh, coming through the academy and I think Bailey Rice is the is the main one. I know you, uh, you boys spoke about uh, Lennon Miller on the on the show yesterday. There was a time not, not that long ago where Bailey Rice and Lennon Miller were seen as, as equals and there was a suggestion that um, Rice actually had, had the higher ceiling that he could have gone on and will become um, a better a better player. It's not that's not that long ago, and you now look at where both players are. So Rice fighting to try and get in a Rangers match day squad. Miller, such an impressive performer uh, for Motherwell, will move on and will move on for several million pounds. Mm. Bring back the reserve league. Uh, that's what I say. Uh, I don't know why they've done away with it in, in the first place. And uh, I think, in terms of development, that would certainly aid the young players playing with senior pros on a regular basis. But uh, I can't see that happening unfortunately and uh yeah uh, the issue of the academy of course that is another role behind the scenes that needs filled that academy director and uh there is big question marks regarding it right now i think uh, legitimate questions as well uh big thanks to uh this donation from uh alchemist who says uh do young players not get a chance to it because two bad games their fans are howling at them in the stadium and online afterwards uh is a heavy shirt to wear chris of course at the rangers jersey uh, and i've seen some folks say no um, some players that maybe leave Rangers and go on and, and achieve uh, good things. I mean, that Miller-Rice comparison, there were a few comments yesterday saying that it's completely different playing for Motherwell and the pressures as opposed to playing for Rangers. 
Um, I think the fans have got a, a part to play as well. I've seen many players coming through the ranks and uh, they might be they might find it tough coming through and, and playing at Ibrooks. It can be a wonderful arena to play football when you're on top and, and you're playing well, but when things aren't quite going so well, uh, it can be it can be tough, can't it? It can be. And I think as as the point is made there, the, the fans do have do have a part to play. Um the fans they cannot demand that players come through come through the system. They cannot demand that players that come through that system are then given a chance in the first team. And when they do then make mistakes or they aren't perhaps at, at the level, you can't then shoot at them and give them a hard time and give give their confidence a, a knock. So yeah. It's it's one thing supporters and even one thing the academy and the club saying we give young players a chance and we want to give young players a chance it's one thing saying it it's another thing actually actually doing it um and the the proof ultimately is in what actually happens on the pitch i think the the sfa report they came out a few weeks ago um was it something like 23 or 29 i can't remember the exact exact number of minutes um but it was less than a half yeah. the number of time that rangers had an under 21 player on the on the pitch in the first um I think in, in the first 33 uh, Premiership matches, that's a staggeringly low number. Um, and that doesn't speak to a club that wants to produce young players. It speaks to a club that has got plenty of finance put to an academy system that produces players up to a certain, a certain standard, but then doesn't give those players the opportunities to prove that they are at the at the level, um, I said, mentioned King and Lowry again. They, they were touted for a long, long time as these guys will go on and be successful Rangers players for one reason or the other. For both of them, it's just not quite, not quite worked out. And I don't think it's a, a one size fits all answer for a number yeah. of young players. You can't just say it's Rangers' fault. You can't just say it's Scottish football's fault. You can't just say it's the players' fault. I think it's it's quite actually a, a complicated answer yeah. to. To determine why it's not quite not quite worked out. So yes, I don't think they have had the correct grounding in the game because the structure in youth terms is just not there. I don't think also that they've had the right opportunities at Rangers at first team level. And part of that, I think, as Alchemist says, it, it is that it's very very difficult to be a Rangers first team player, um, and it's very very difficult to come through come through the academy and then make that make that um, leap. You can have all the technical ability in the world like Alec Lowry has on, on pure technical ability. He deserves a spot in, in the Rangers first team, but that's sometimes just not enough. Um, I think we've seen that before. We'll no doubt, in no doubt see it again. Guys that I've talked about up to a certain level, when you actually find out what what's involved in being a Rangers first team player, uh, is, is, a difficult, um, is a difficult bridge to get up. Yeah, it sure is. Uh, big thanks as well to uh, DJ Boomtastic, who's gifted five Rangers Review memberships. So thank you very much uh, for that, sir. That is very kind of you to do just that. Um, there's a, a bit of a left field comment here uh, from Jim. He says, if it was left to me, I would force teams to play at least one academy player for at least 30 minutes every game in the League Cup. Um, I get where you're coming from there, Jim. I actually, I remember, I think uh, European competitions you are uh, you do need to have, have so many academy players on your, in your match day squad. I actually watched a recent interview with Ross McCormack uh, on Open Goal, and he was talking about his time coming through at Rangers and uh, going away uh, and being in squads. But he was just felt he, it was just because the club had to, as opposed to deserving his chance uh, on the bench. So uh, I would I wouldn't like that clubs being forced to play young players. I would like to think that uh, young boys will. will Earn their opportunities in the first in the first team, as opposed to uh, clubs being forced to play them on the pitch. Uh, a few other comments before we wrap up the show today. Some good questions have been fired in. Uh, James with the point says, "Do you think we should drop ten position and have three in midfield as we struggle in the middle of the park as we're always outnumbered?" Uh, I was on, uh, I think, was it a Cuny on Monday? I recorded. A, I was on. Uh, did a. a it's not a regular thing, but we're on TikTok yesterday for, for a live in the afternoon uh, and someone uh, was criticising Clement's uh, style of play and his formation and suggesting that Rangers should go two up top, Chris, which uh, I think might be, I like two up front, I've got to say. Uh, I was thinking maybe changing to a 3-5-2, but the thing is, Clement very 
Um, he's stuck in his ways. It's, it's, it's a formation that he has played not only at Rangers, but at previous clubs as well. And it has been successful, certainly in Belgium. He likes that number 10, two wingers and a centre forwards. But uh, do you think Rangers should be scrapping the 10? I can't imagine we'll be doing that now, given the outlay to, uh, for uh, Nadine Bayrami. Um, but has James got a point here? I think in certain games, it could certainly be an option. You look, think, even think back to, to last weekend, um, if as, as dictated by, by availability, but could we have seen a man up there alongside Danilo against uh, St. Johnson at home, against some other of, of the perhaps lower-ranked uh, Premiership sides, certainly at, at Ibrox, can you have two can you have two strikers on the pitch at, at the one time? I think there's, there's certainly a case for it. In terms of dropping dropping the ten and going to going to three in, in midfield, I think it's something we spoke ahead of the uh, last old firm game. We'll speak about it ahead of the next old firm game. That's for me the the way to go. Um, I I don't think that particular system works against Celtic. I think Rangers have to have to have to change it in that regard. Who that third person or who that third player is, whether it's Raskin, whether it's Sterling, to give you a bit more about defensive uh, minded option in there. Um, I think it's something Rangers do have to uh, do have to look at. But um, as you as you reference there, the manager has his um, has his outlook, he has his philosophy, has his has his way of playing. Um, we've not really seen it change that often um, during his time at, at Rangers. So I would be surprised if it's going to be a, a significant change. It might well be in in certain matches. Can it can it be uh, can it be tweaked? I don't think that would be a bad thing. Yeah, uh, Scott Gervin's kindly donated to the channel. Thank you, Scott. It says, uh, just on uh, the issue of the academies, listen, how are we meant to build a player trading model and we never give the youngsters a chance? The rice thing, it stands out. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a player trading model is something that Rangers will have to, uh, we've seen it, we heard it from uh, John Bennett, of course, and uh, it needs to be revitalised and up and running. Uh, it hasn't been for some time now. Right, that will do us there. A uh, big thank you to you all for uh, your questions. Absolutely fantastic questions being fired in, so thank you. Uh, before we go, uh, just a bit of admin. Uh, of course, uh, the Rangers Review live show comes back to the stage this coming Wednesday. Uh, we're down in London, so if you had a, uh, a London-based or a, a Southern Bear down there, then uh, tickets are still available. The uh, promoters, the Volley and Admiral, uh, kindly gave us uh, a code, a 50% off code, RR50. If you use that in the checkout, you get 50% off the ticket. So uh, head over to uh, eventbrite.co.uk or you can head over to rangersreview.co.uk uh, the link is also below this video, so if you fancy it, a night out talking all things Rangers with myself, Joshua, and Mark Hately, no less, at the Volley in London, uh, then go and get your tickets now. So, uh, yeah, uh, looking forward to that. Um, there will be uh, a few videos to come over the course of the next few days as well. We might be in uh, smack bang in the eye of the international break, but uh, there's still uh, Rangers content coming your way, folks, so keep your eyes peeled, as Chris says as well, on the website, a uh, great piece on the uh, Academy also. Uh, and if you are a viewer to the Rangers Review, um, uh, then I know that many of you watch and aren't subscribed, and uh, if you make sure you subscribe, it makes uh, then make sure that you get a, a notification. If you hit that bell, uh, you, you'll get the a wee alarm call whenever we go live. And it's not just the morning briefing, of course, we get many other videos as well throughout the course of the week. Right. Thank you to you all. Uh, I will be back uh, Monday. Uh, hopefully you enjoy your weekend. You up to much, Chris, without any Rangers action to concern yourself with? Uh, no, no, no plans. I'm actually off off the weekend and then off next week. So I will uh, I'll leave leave the entire operation in the capable hands of uh, yourself, Joshua, and uh, and Stevie as well. So I will I'll leave it all with you and ho hopefully all is all is well in Rangers world by the time I get back. Yeah, hopefully it's not that that meme when the guy walks into the kitchen and with his pizzas and it's all on all, all on fire. But uh, yeah, hopefully uh, it goes hunky dory. Enjoy your time off. But uh, yeah, fantastic. Right, we'll speak to you later, folks. Enjoy your weekend. Bye for now.